This video goes with section 63 of Hansen and Quinn's Greek, an intensive course, and covers what they call conditional sentences with relative protices. I call them whoever clauses, and perhaps we should call them clauses of whatever. You'll find Hansen and Quinn's explanation of these clauses on pages 176 to 178. So what are we talking about here? Let me give you some examples in English. Whoever stole my lunch is in trouble. Whatever I touch turns to gold. We will welcome whomever they send. I'm going to work full time for whoever is the nominee. In each of these sentences, there's a clause that indicates uh, some indefiniteness, some doubt about or lack of knowledge about um, one of the reference of the sentence, who we're talking about, but it's important to indicate that person even though we don't know the specifics of who it is or what it is. So whoever stole my lunch, I don't know who that is, but whoever it is, that person's in trouble. Whatever I touch turns to gold. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, there's an indefiniteness about that, but whatever it is, it turns to gold when I touch it. Um, we will welcome whomever they send. We don't know who it is. It's indefinite, but um, we will welcome whatever person shows up. And I'm going to work full time for whoever is the nominee. I don't know which one it is, but I know that I will work for my party's nominee, no matter who that is. And that's the indefiniteness there that we don't know yet. English grammarians call these whoever clauses indefinite noun clauses, and that will be a useful way for us to think of them later on in this video. But now let's ask how Greek expresses the same ideas. It uses a relative pronoun, usually with the particle on, and with mood or tense changes. So I'm going to go through three different ways for understanding, identifying, and getting to a translation of these clauses. The first I'll call the spot the hosan way, which is how I deal with whoever clauses in real Greek. The second is the Hansen and Quinn way to explain them. And the third we'll be thinking about them again as noun clauses. The key to all of these is to see, to recognize, the whoeverness, the fact that you're looking at one of these indefinite clauses. And once you do, it's pretty natural to let the cases and moods tell you how to translate. So first, let's look at the spot the hoss on way. For me, the switch flips on whoeverness whenever I see hoss on and the subjunctive, which is the most common form of the whoever clause. I see that and I think immediately whoever and I make sure that I use the relative pronoun in the correct case and just translate the rest of the sentence in a straightforward way. So, first example. Utoi eleotheros hos an tosomati dulewe. Hey, there's a hos an and hey, there's a subjunctive verb. And so, we can translate this, whoever, Hassan, is a slave to the body, and there's our subjunctive verb, is not free, you know, utoi eleotheros. But the relative pronoun is not always in the nominative case. So sometimes you'll have a sentence like this, a la kai sophos, kai eleotheros, who on hepsuche arche. Again, we've got hosan and the subjunctive. It's not hosan here, it's who on, but we have the relative pronoun and on and a subjunctive verb. And so we can translate, but whose soul rules, there with the possessive genitive case of the relative pronoun, is both wise and free. But whose soul rules is both wise and free. We don't know who that is, it's indefinite, but in any instance where that's true, that person is wise and free. Here's another example. Kakai 
Has hoi kakoi de daskaloi paideuosen an. Here you can see that the an doesn't always have to be right next to the relative pronoun, but the subjunctive and the an are enough to show me the whoeverness anyway, because we still have a relative pronoun, has, and we still have an, and there's our subjunctive paideuosen. And so we get evil are, kakai, whomever evil teachers educate, has, of course, as you've learned when you learn the relative pronoun, always pay attention to case, and the relative pronoun will be the case that it needs to be in its clause. Here, the relative pronoun is feminine accusative plural to be the direct object of paideosin. And the other thing to say about this example is that English doesn't bring out the fact that the kakai and the has are feminine. You could say, if you wanted to bring that out, whatever women evil teachers educate are evil. But that feels a little clunky in English. This is one of the places where Greek um, can phrase it better. Let's go on to our next example. Ha daan en therapeye a ido e akuso sigesomai. This sentence has the neuter ha for the relative pronoun. And if you're watching this while doing Hansen and Quinn in order, it also has some vocabulary that you're not familiar with that I've put um, rather small down in the corner. But we've got the telltale ha on and the subjunctive with ido and akuso. But since we're neuter this time, it's going to be whatever, and the, since the subject of both subjunctives is I, then the neuter has to be the direct object, and that's why it's in the accusative. So you translate the rest just as it is, and we get, and whatever I see or hear in treatment, I will keep secret. This is actually a portion of the Hippocratic Oath, the ancient text that has come down to us that still forms part of the training and ethics of modern physicians. Now the Haas on, the spot the Haas on method starts to fail when you run into sentences where you can see the Haas and the on, but the on isn't with the relative pronoun or in the same clause as the relative pronoun and the verb with the relative clause isn't the subjunctive, as in this sentence. Or, if you see the relative pronoun, but there's no on anywhere, and you notice that the verb with the relative pronoun is optative, and you realize something's going on that's not a normal relative clause. You are still seeing the whoeverness there. You still see that something that's not a regular relative clause is going on. And that's when I turned to other ways. And here we'll talk about Hansen and Quinn's way of explaining these clauses. They use the same logic that they use for conditional sentences, which you met in section 41 and on their pages 93 to 98. You've been seeing that in action with hoss on and the subjunctive, which, which matches up nicely with the future more vivid conditional and if you make your way through the conditionals chart with the relative pronoun instead of aon or a, you'll see that hosan and the subjunctive pattern also matches nicely with present general. But you can do the same sort of indefinite clause in place of any of the if clauses of the conditional sentences that you've already learned. So here's what you've seen so far, starting with the excerpt from the Hippocratic Oath, which Hansen and Quinn would match up to future more vivid. And three other examples were all what Hansen and Quinn would call present general. Hos, on, and the subjunctive, and the present indicative in our main clause. But then we saw two that didn't have hos, on, and the subjunctive, and the other patterns will help us out. Here are the two sentences one with hoss, but with the on in a separate place and without subjunctive, and one with hoss, but no on and no subjunctive.
But if we look at the verb of the first sentence, we see the aorist indicative, which we also see in the protasis of the past contrary to fact. And the apodosis matches up too. It's aorist indicative plus on. And so you can use the good old contrary to fact formula to translate that indefinite sentence. Whoever had stolen the gold, the citizens would have indicted that man. And that works perfectly well. And the Hansen and Quinn way really helps us there because it lets us see how to manage those particular moods and tenses. If you look at the next example, I can see that the, the relative pronoun, but it's with an optative, which clues me into the whoeverness. And then I can see that optatives appear in two spots in the chart of conditionals. But the main verb here doesn't fit any of the patterns. And what you have here is a mixed but perfectly natural pattern. Without an optative plus on in the main clause, choose the past general option for an indefinite clause and translate whoever stole the wine, hos ton oinon klepsai, will be sent to the island, eistain nason pemphesetai. Again, this is what Hansen and Quinn would call a mixed conditional or probably a mixed indefinite sentence. Um, and that's perfectly natural. They don't emphasize it very much, but both in Greek and in English, the chart is a nice way to understand things, but in the natural versions of both languages, we often mix up a past general protasis with a future more vivid apodosis, and that's what we've done here. So really, what I've done is use both Hansen and Quinn's understanding and spot the Hassan to see the whoeverness and translate those sentences. A relative pronoun and an optative make me see the whoeverness, and I get a little help from Hansen and Quinn's conditional charts, and then I can translate. A relative pronoun with an on somewhere outside of the clause alerts me to the whoeverness, and then the Hansen and, Char Hansen and Quinn conditional patterns help me take it to pass contrary to fact and understand how to translate. One more note on the Hansen and Quinn way. So they teach whoever clauses with the new Unit 7 demonstrative pronoun ekenos, ekene, ekena. And they teach that the relative pronoun in the indefinite clause is pointing to the antecedent ekenon in the main clause. And that works fine in this sentence. But of course, you also have to see the past contrary to factness to translate. In this sentence, I see the hasan, the whoeverness, right away, han an pausosi. But to understand that relative pronoun working the same way as in relative clauses, I need to find an antecedent in the main clause. Hansen and Quinn would have me understand or supply an akanos in the main clause and in my translation. But to me, that doesn't feel like natural Greek or natural English. But they are on to something about the relationship between the indefinite clause and the main clause. So whomever they stop is being guarded. It works if you specify whomever they stop, that man is being guarded, but it's a little awkward. It's just more natural and ordinary to say whomever they stop is being guarded instead of whomever they stop, that man is being guarded, unless you really want to emphasize that man. But they are on to something about the relationship between the indefinite clause and the main clause. And here I'd like to return to the English grammar categorization of whoever clauses as noun clauses. A noun clause is a whole clause that takes the place of a noun in the sentence structure. So here's our same example. This explanation will also show you the basics of sentence diagramming, which I hope will help you see how a whole clause can substitute for a noun. A basic sentence is diagrammed with a horizontal line and a crossing vertical line that divides the subject from the predicate. So here's our line and our divider. 
and we can put is being guarded as our predicate. And then we could put an understood he, the parentheses mean we're supposed to understand it, that it's not actually stated in the sentence, in the subject spot. The next thing you need to know about diagramming is how to show a direct object. On the predicate part of the line, you add another vertical divider, but it doesn't cross below the main line. So you can diagram the indefinite clause of our sentence this way, they stop whomever. And then you can use this little pedestal connector to show exactly how that indefinite clause is substituting for a noun or a pronoun. Let me diagram two more examples to help you see. Here you need to know how to diagram an equal sign sentence or subject verb complement sentence which we've been seeing all the time as nominal sentences. In this instance, the second divider leans back towards the subject, which I like as a pointer to the connection between subject and complement. So our big old nominal sentence here understands or supplies R in the verb spot and evil as the complement. And then you put the whole clause, the whole indefinite clause, on a pedestal to be the subject. You also see here how, di how to diagram adjectives and other modifiers. You can translate this either the way we translated before, evil are whomever evil teachers educate, or you can translate it the other way around, whomever evil teachers educate are evil. So you can see there that English and Greek can turn things either way in word order, but the relationship among the different words are as indicated in the diagram. One more example. This is one of the examples from before, but without the akanon. So hos ton kruson eklepsen agrapsanta an hoi politai. The citizens would have indicted whoever had stolen the gold. You can diagram the main clause like this. The citizens would have indicted. And then you've got that direct object spot. Whom would they have indicted? You can put the whole clause on a pedestal instead of just a noun or a pronoun. They would have indicted whoever had stolen the gold. Now, have a look at it in Greek. Same structure, but now it's got the Greek and you can see again our relative, our indefinite relative clause is there on the pedestal taking the place of a noun or pronoun in the direct object spot of this diagram. So that's all the ways I can think of to help you understand and translate these clauses. The key is seeing the whoeverness realizing that you're looking at an indefinite clause, and then letting the cases and moods tell you how to translate. Most of the time, you'll run into hos on and the subjunctive in these clauses, and then you just translate the indicative of the main clause in the usual way. But sometimes you'll need to recognize one of the other patterns, and as long as you realize that you may need to do that, and you've got Hansen and Quinn's ideas about the different conditional sentences, available to you, you'll be just fine. I hope that now you're confident about seeing and translating these whoever clauses when you come across them in Hansen and Quinn and in Greek in the wild. This video was very long in the making and benefited greatly from the help of my students. Thank you to all of you.